What's up guys? If you're anything like me, you found yourself with a lot of time on your hands since being stuck in quarantine. You may be struggling to avoid absolute boredom. Well, we've got the solution for you, books. Pick one up and allow yourself to escape into another world. Not sure what to read? Check out the following book recommendations from our Aces and Assets team. Enjoy. I'm here today to tell you all about uh, what is one of my favorite books of all time and uh, hopefully spark your interest a little bit. Uh, it is Dune by Frank Herbert. For all of you Aces folks, um, especially middle school folks, this one is going to be a little maybe up on the, uh, the, the difficulty side of the scale for you if you're looking for a, uh, a light, easy quarantine read. But if you are ready to dig into one of the biggest and most uh, interconnected, complicated uh, uh, pieces of writing to undergird science fiction as we have known it for over... Uh, 60 years at this point almost, then uh, get ready for a ride. So Dune was first published in the 60s by not a science fiction publisher, but actually a, a publisher of technical manuals, um, because at the time science fiction was printed in small serialized stories, and uh, this wasn't going to go out in a magazine. It originally did in small chapters, but uh, the book in total was first printed by a publisher of automotive technical manuals because they were the only folks accustomed to making runs that big for that small an audience. Um, so in Dune, however, what we're talking about are questions that were heavy on the minds of many people in Herbert's day and remain relevant now. These are questions about, can we trust charismatic leaders? Can we uh, achieve perfection by refining any one element of our humanity to the exclusion of others? Can we survive on a planet with limited resources in a system that demands infinite productivity and output? output? Um, I hope that uh, some of you are uh, already pondering these questions because they remain relevant today as much as they were back in the 1960s. Dune is the story of uh, Paul Atreides, the heir of House Atreides, uh, as they take over Arrakis, the only planet in the universe which uh, is able to produce the drug Spice, on which all society runs. It enables space travel by allowing ship navigators to see into the future well enough to steer around stars and astrological objects. It allows for uh, Mentats, the human computers who have replaced their technological counterparts, uh, to uh, predict uh, based on uh, almost superhuman leaps of logic, it uh, lengthens the the life of the consumer. It is the true panacea, and it is found only on Dune. And so, what we see follow is Paul's journey through destruction defeat, betrayal, uh, as he learns to see the, the danger and the damage of these systems, and also how he is, even as he tries to dismantle 
these systems inescapably trapped by them. So I hope that you will decide to give yourself a bit of a challenge. Pick this up, give it a shot. Hey guys, for my spring break, I decided to read the book Scythe by Neil Shusterman. It's the first book in a trilogy known as The Ark of a Scythe. Typically, I don't read fantasy or sci-fi books, but I was drawn into this one just based on the premise. So the story takes place in a utopian world where humans are no longer suffering from things like hunger, poverty, war, government corruption, but above all else, death. The medical field has advanced so much that humans no longer have to worry about dying. At least that's what you think at first. Because the population continues to grow and there's only a certain amount of space available on Earth, there has to be some way to manage the growth. So there's a special organization known as the Scythedom that's been assigned the task of deciding who gets to live and who gets to die. The story revolves around two teenagers, Citra and Rowan, that have both been chosen as apprentices to learn and train under the Scythes. Um, in the hopes that one of them can eventually become a member of the Scythedom. Now, initially, neither one wants to become a, a Scythe because it's such an ugly task having to take someone's life away. It's not easy to become a Scythe. You have to be someone with um, a strong moral compass, someone who demonstrates compassion, empathy, reason. And one of the Scythes, specifically Scythe Faraday, sees that in both Citra and Rowan, which is why he chooses two apprentices as opposed to one. Now the story is really interesting because you learn that the Scythedom is a self-governing entity. So they're above the law. Um, you know, there are a set of commandments that they're supposed to adhere to, but you start to see how human nature gets in the way of doing their job. I mean, at the end of the day, they still, you know, have to deal with things like greed, desire, and all kinds of ulterior motives. So even though they're tasked with this job that requires um, a high moral ground, you start to see that the Scythedom really isn't all that perfect and can also be a victim to corruption. And that's kind of all you need to know for now. Uh, the book is, I think it's about 40 chapters long, but every chapter is relatively short. There's a lot of action, a lot of information being revealed in each chapter, so it goes pretty quickly. Um, I have to say there's no point in the story where it starts to slow down or it feels like it's dragging. So I would highly recommend this book, especially if you love um, anything that involves action, mystery, there are plenty of twists in the book, and then of course there is a little bit of romance. Um, it is not a, a sappy love story though, I do want to tell you guys that. Um, yeah, so you can find it on Libby or Overdrive, which are two apps that um, where you can read the book for free as long as you have an account with the public library. So I encourage you guys, go ahead, check it out. I was The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, who also wrote Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit is based in a world where fantastical creatures coexist. Hobbits, elves, um, goblins, orcs, humans. It's a fantasy world. It's a fantasy book and a fantasy adventure. And mostly it's based upon a main character named Bilbo, who is a halfling, or a hobbit, which is essentially half a person, very small. And he is asked to go on an adventure with a company of dwarves that are trying to gain back their homeland, which was overtaken by a dragon called Smell. So there is a wise wizard named Gandalf who invites Bilbo on their journey to be a burglar. Um, in a sense to take back a very important jewel that the dwarves prized very highly named the Arkenstone, which the dragon is hoarding. For these dwarves that are essentially homeless right now, they don't have a place to live. They're mostly, you know, like making work for humans and not their dignity is kind of gone. So this is one of the main reasons why they want to go get their home back. The main dwarf named Thorin. Um, is not um, extremely fond of elves and just dwarves in general have, you know, some stere stereotypes and prejudices, but along the way they um, 
say gain the help of other people, such as the you know, Rivendell. Basically, you know, for directions. Um, they face a lot of troubles facing, you know, um, orcs <clears throat> chasing them around, trying to interrupt their journey. They have to get across stone giants that are like in their way and non directly trying to kill them. And it's mostly about uh, to see if they are able to reclaim their home and if the main dwarf, Thorin, is able to set aside his own desires in order to do the greater good. And it's all in the perspective of Bilbo Baggins, who is a very likable character, very brave, who tries to find um, a semblance of who he used to be, a very adventurous, very brave little person. It's a very nice book. The language is a little bit fancy, but not too fancy. And it's very fun to read. It's very short. It's about 200 pages, depending on your copy. And if you're into fantasy worlds and quirky, memorable characters, then I highly recommend you read this book and have as much fun with it as I have throughout my life. I've, I'm in love with Middle Earth and I hope that you may end up liking it. Guys, I'm currently reading The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Um, I know you're probably thinking like, does this concept of the five love languages even apply to me or you know being a child um, and the answer is yes um, when you're younger you know you may or may not uh, know what your primary love language is or your friends or a family member anybody maybe even your parent you know um, I think you should try them out um, a few um, examples of the love language is uh, active service uh, words of affirmation quality time uh, receiving gifts, you know, you should try one until you hit one. But if you don't, you can just pay attention to the way that, you know, your friend might act or how your cousin might act and be like, uh, you know, I wonder what's going on or, you know, and then that right there will allow you to know that person's love language the more attention that you pay. Um, I have an example, like my eight-year-old son, you know, he likes making me gifts. He makes me gifts every day. He'll put like a stick figure on a piece of paper. He'll wrap it up with some tape. And he'll be like, here, mom, you know, this is for you. Do you know what his love language is? Receiving gifts. He loves to receive gifts. He loves when I do little things for him. And those are the type of things how you can, you know, understand somebody's love language is the things that they do unto other people. Another example is I have a 12 year old and she likes to help out. She likes to help out in any way, shape, form or fashion. Oh mom, can I help you cook? Can I help wash the dishes? Can I help give my sister a bath? You know, she just likes to help. Can you guess what her love language is? Acts of service, you know? She just loves doing the littlest things, the littlest things for somebody helps her out and that's how you just understand, you know, somebody else's love language, the little things that they're doing to you. So there are many different ways to understand yours, other ways to understand your friends, other ways to understand your mom, your dad, auntie, cousin, anybody. Literally just pay attention to how somebody treats you and you'll understand what their love language is.